Hello, welcome. This is the overview for the real estate brokerage 10-year financial model. I'm going to go through each tab, explain how it works. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, like the video, and you'll be able to purchase this through the link below. It's going to be a $75 one-time fee. So the global control tab is just going to explain high-level things like the name of the company, the launch year, the end month you want the forecast to stop at, and if you want to include the terminal value of the business or not, and that's going to be based on the EBITDA multiple. So pretty straightforward stuff there. Cash sources, this is only for traditional debt funding. The rest of these inputs will be on the cap table, but here you can define if you're going to put any debt, and let's say I put in like 250000 the total equity required is going to drop if I fund more with debt. Any remaining goes to investor money and the breakdown between investors versus owners is going to be on the cap table. You'll be able to find that here based on any contributions up to 20 outside investor groups or individuals and 20 insiders or individuals in their share. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, you can also define tax rates here if you want or if you don't want to show taxes on the pro forma, you can always zero this out. And then we've got our sanity checks right up front on all this, the summaries. These should always be zero, zero. And this is checking to make sure all the different summaries all equal to the same amount and have the same data on them. So the first main tab is the revenue assumptions. This is where you're going to define how the brokerage makes money, uh, the start month of operations. And so let's go through one of these. So um, you can define the started, the starting expected number of deals completed per month from all agents. And then you could do the monthly growth of that in each year. So if you define 10 here, that means in year one, the first month, whenever the, the start month is of operations, we'll have 10. The next month we'll have 2% more than that. And then it's 2% more than that and so on. Because this is a compounding growth rate, whatever you define it as here. Average deals done per agent per month. So this is going to be the, the ratio input to define how many actual agents you have at any one point in time. And so it'll be based on the total deals you're completing against how many deals you think on average each agent is going to do. You also have the average sales price. So this is um, of the real estate deals. What's the average sales price? This will drive commissions, volumes, um, and you can adjust that over time. Average commission on sale, usually in real estate, the the selling fees, you'll be between 5 and 7%. You define that there. Then you could define of the total deals that you're completing of these here, how many of those are sell side deals versus buy side deals. And then on the sell side, you could define the share of the brokerage firm's commissions as well. well you can define of the commissions for sell side, how much is going to the sell, the seller's agency's brokerage, and then of that, how much is split between the uh, broker, this is how much the broker is earning versus how much the agent is getting, which would just be the reciprocal of this percentage for the agent. Then you got percentage of buy side, and on the buy side deals, what's the firm's share of that and then of that how much are they splitting between the agent and the actual broker remember this model is from the perspective of the broker deal type two so this is allowing you to have a second configuration this could be deals just from the firm itself so they might have different uh stats as far as how many deals they're doing uh, if there's agents or not the share of commissions of the uh, brokers versus the agents and the percentage of buy side versus sell side deals, as well as the average sales price. So the point of this is to have two potential deal configurations and or just have one deal configuration for agents and then one for the firm itself based on, you know, just the firm's uh, founders or partners doing their own activities. And in that case, maybe they would have uh, 100 percent share of the commission uh, or some different structure here. So it's just to al allow some uh, greater flexibility in the forecast. Then down here, I did put some KPIs. <clears throat> so based on these numbers above, it will show on average, what are the agents earning in commissions each month? 
within each year. So this is taking the commissions, average commissions per agent at the end of each, uh, basically December of each year and showing you what that is. Also, you got the total commissions for the brokerage each year. So this would be whatever these percentages are defined here. That's driving those numbers against the volume and the commission uh, splits. And then you've also got total volume per year. So these numbers will change as you adjust the assumptions here. So that's the main meat and potatoes of the model. Uh, the rest of this is pretty standard. So on cost assumptions, you know, you've got to run the broker. So you could have some fixed expenses, licenses, uh, managers, uh, office rent, all that, th all that kind of thing. So you can define this, all the different details of those costs when they start and the monthly cost in each year. Uh, in these top three sections. And remember, if this is a salary item, you would include the fully loaded cost. So that includes payroll taxes, benefits. Now, here's some catch-all. So this is where you can define a percentage of total monthly revenue. And this percentage will just apply to the net revenue, meaning it's not going to apply to the total commissions of the firm. It's only going to apply to the brokerage brokerage's share of commission, so their revenue. Then you've got variable costs. So this is if you're going to pay, you know, for marketing per agent. And I split into the agents in deal type one and two because those might have different spends per month. And you can define how much they're going to be um, given in marketing allowances, maybe some software so they can do their deals easier or cleaner contract management software all that sort of thing so up to five different variable costs per agent per month debt schedule just a standard debt schedule so if you're going to fund any of the startup costs and or operational burn with debt like we put on the global control you would define the amount here that flows right over to the top and then you could define the terms and the start month when that those funds are received and then the resulting payback. Note if an exit value is defined, then on the exit month, any debt remaining will be repaid and that will hit cash flow accordingly. If if a terminal value is not included and you hit no here, then you could see the debt schedule just go into perpetuity until it's, you know the amortized term is over. CapEx, so this is if you've got any depreciable items. Maybe you're buying the building to put your offices in. That's possible, so there's going to be depreciation and CapEx to that. Or if you've got other equipment items, computers, anything that's depreciable, you can put on here uh, the month is purchased and the useful life. If you do zero these out, never zero out column F. You can zero these out by zeroing out C, uh, column C, and uh, D. But don't ever zero these up because then you'll have error through the model. Cap table we went over, you're just defining uh, this is the minimum equity required based on startup costs and any burn, total shares, how much percentage is, is common versus the class A and B. If you have other share types, usually you, you will just have everything in common shares, so 100% here. And then you just define how much you're getting. Uh, overflow tab is an automated calculation that takes the total needed less any other funds received from any other outside investors and any inside investors, and then the remaining will come here. If this is negative, that means you've put in a number that's greater than the actual minimum equity required. Uh, if you want a reserve, you can always go to the startup cost here and put in a reserve, and in that case, when you actually hit zero on the balance sheet for cash, you would have whatever this reserve amount is. Um, you've also got, uh, so you define the, the amount invested by each individual, the percentage of common stock they're getting, and then the resulting cash flow of each and the IRR of each individual in, in aggregate for outsiders and insiders. Terminal value, this is just to define the percentage of the exit proceeds that are applied to extraordinary income versus fixed assets. If you don't have any fixed assets or if they're fully depreciated, you could just put 100% here, meaning it just all goes to extraordinary income. And again, this will not be relevant if you are going to zero out the taxes. 
Startup costs, we already kind of went over this, but you're just defining the one-time costs of the business. So like if you're going to build a website, um, you're going to have some legal counsel or different costs that happen before any operations actually begin or any costs to get things off the ground. Um, you put those here. You don't want to double count. So if you've got costs elsewhere, don't also put them here. Now we've got uh, the three statement model. So financial statements, this is the income statement, monthly and annual. Uh, we've just got our total commissions earned by the firm, the payout to agents, net revenue, cost of goods sold would be those variable costs per agent, um, contribution margin, or this could also be considered your gross profit. Then operating expenses, total OPEX, earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization interest depreciation expense and then we've got our here you can see if there is a sale there was none but if we put one in here you can see on that last month there'll be a tax uh, bigger tax happening uh, based on the tax rates and the sales proceeds um, otherwise it's just operational income taxes on that income and it's pretty straightforward here Annual income statement is the same as the monthly, but just on an annual basis. Then we've got balance sheet. You've got cash is the only real current asset. You've got other fixed assets that are long-term based on that CapEx schedule, accumulated depreciation, total assets. Any liabilities would just basically be that one loan. And then you've got owner's equity would be any funds contributed, which is based on the minimum equity required. And that's why our balance always, we see a net cash, we solve for zero, but never below zero on the cash. Um, so you got that and you've got retained earnings. Assets always equal liabilities plus uh, owner's equity. So we have that check here all through the model. And that will always be right or correct and updated as long as um, your assumptions are logical. Um, for example, uh, here you wouldn't put uh, yes, but then make the multiple zero on the exit. You would just either put no here, um, if, or if you had yes, this has to be some positive integer. Okay, uh, so balance sheet, cash flow statement kind of shows you uses and sources of funds. So here's what's happening with operational activities. In each monthly period, here's um, investing activities, and then here's financing activities and the net change in cash each period. Annual cash flow statement, same deal, but on an annual basis. Visuals, a lot of cool visuals here. Um, I'll zero out the exit just so that looks cleaner for this purpose. But you've got annual net revenue, annual EBITDA, note net revenue, so that's the amount um, after the broker or after the agents are paid their share. So this is just the uh, brokerage's net revenue. EBITDA, cash flow, uh, total annual deals completed by type. Remember there's um, two types, deal type one and deal type two in the revenue assumptions. So these are the deals happening of each type. You've got annual commissions by deal type and by sell side. So every year you can see here's the broker commissions um, on sell side type one. Here's the broker commissions on uh, buy side type one and then sell side type two, buy side type two. So I try to color code them. So these two are um, your sell side or these two are your type one and these two are your type two. So I try to make them kind of color coded so you can see here's what you're generating from deal type one. Here's what you're generating from deal type two. And from the buy side slash sell side. Annual variable costs, again, the fix or the, the cost per um, agent per month would be what's driving this. And then the ratio of how many agents you need or how many agents how many deals agents are completing each month will determine how many they are, are and what they're getting paid for you know marketing and software costs average monthly earnings per agent this is just a direct function of your assumptions 
uh, monthly deals of deal type one, buy and sell side, monthly deals deal type two, buy and sell side, and then total agents by deal type. So we've got, again, those two types. Here's the agents in type one. Here's the agents in type two. And note if type two was a uh, model where it's just the firm and there are no other agents, then this would just be a zero for type two. Distributions, this is just discounted cash flow analysis for the whole project. Total costs against total distributions. Here's the internal rate of return. Uh, here's the discounted cash flow analysis based on the discount rate, the net present value. Um, investor cash flows, owner cash flows. So this is splitting up the project into two parts. Um, how much the investors are contributing, owners, and then their resulting share based on those percentages defined in the cap table here. Then we have executive summary. Here's where you can see the high level. So net revenues for the brokerage, variable costs, fixed expenses, EBITDA, debt service coverage ratio, also other cash flow items. So now you can really see everything all in one spot and then cash position over time. And then we've got IRR, uh, equity multiple and ROI for the project as a whole and on the investor side and owner side. Monthly detail, this is where you can actually see the results of all the assumptions, the total deals happening per month for type one and type two, uh, how many agents there are for type one and type two, uh, the sell side versus buy side deals, total volume, total commission, sell side commission share, and then share between agent and brokerage. Uh, we aggregate this down here. Where this is where we calculate commissions per month per agent. Um, then we have total commissions less the agent's share, total brokerage commissions, variable cost logic, our contribution margin, then fixed expenses, other cash flow items, and actual cash flow. Annual details is the same thing, but you see all these uh, metrics on an annual basis. So it's a pretty clean model, and it's got all the logic. Uh, we've got financial statement forecasts, and you can drive everything based on the revenue assumptions, cost assumptions, and then we've got a lot of global summaries to determine different financing structures. So it's a pretty great model. Uh, if you are thinking about starting a real estate brokerage firm, this will help you think through a lot of the logic and how you want to set it up. So enjoy and uh, like the video, subscribe. You can purchase the template in the, in the link below. Um, and I'll see you on the next one.